You're an entry person yourself. Oh, you're yes, right. An out and out entry person. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> There's four little ones that go straight down into the sea. Have you been up at Sleeve League? No. No, seriously? No. Can you get the hang of it after a while? I hope I don't make a mess. No. Make a you, mess you, you couldn't. You couldn't. You want to bet? <laughs> you, you didn't leave it alone. Every ten minutes you were up here. Every ten minutes you were torturing it with that stick. Oh, you, know, you, were, you were had to, you see. Yeah. I don't think I'd been acting about four days before that point. <laughs> <laughs> That's actually uh, the dried bodies of insects. Yeah, two minutes, seriously. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. I'll have a brighter place somewhere in my collection. They have their very own version of the Atlantis myth in this part of the world, whereby the enchanted land of High Brazil appears periodically a few miles out to sea. It's a land of beautiful vistas and sandy shores. But as soon as anyone attempts to reach it by boat, a fairy mist descends and the land disappears from sight. What I find most mysterious about this legend is why anyone would want to leave this very real enchanted land for another across the sea. Welcome to Slave League and the mountains and headlands of southwest Donegal. Or maybe this is High Brazil. Maybe that's how the magic works that we've reached the island but forgotten how we came here. That's one possible explanation for the fairyland quality of this seascape, the dramatic entrance to Teelan Harbour, sculpted by water elves who crossed from Slego in centuries past. The towering ramparts of Bunglass bracing themselves against the unveiling Atlantic hordes, whose armies are infinite, whose march is relentless, and whose slay advances are never-ending. There's a kind of scenery, and we're blessed with it here along our coasts and in other places, that leaves us, quite literally at times, breathless with excitement and tingling with danger-induced adrenaline. It's most palpable here at Sleeve League, but it stays with you in a kind of remembered glow as you draw slower breaths in the lee of the mountain and on into Glen Column Kill and further east along the coast to the little towns of Carrick and Kilcar. The similarities with the North Antrim coast are obvious, if somewhat superficial. There's even a Rathlin Island here, Rathlin O'Byrne to give it its proper name. But I'm standing on a piece of coastline here that's just a little bit older than North Antrim. About 500 million years ago, this cliff was the ocean floor. Now it's swapped places with itself, confusing the birds in the process. There is such glamour and colour and drama in this landscape, so much to beguile the eye and transfix your gaze that you need to exercise its spell. Get into it, swim in it, walk in it, climb it. Something that gets you feeling the fabric, wearing it instead of just admiring it. The magnificent Slave Lake at 1,972 feet, the highest and scariest sea cliffs anywhere in Europe. Also, I suspect the windiest as well, because if I wasn't hanging on to this fence post, I think I'd be somewhere else entirely. When tourists come up here, they tend to stay a long time, not just because they're enjoying the view, but because they're terrified of facing the journey back down that road again. What's even more frightening for me is that tomorrow morning, I'll be down there somewhere underneath it in a boat. Well, that's the plan anyway. Next day, I am indeed ploughing along the Atlantic edge in Adrian Malloy's boat in the company of local author Michael O'Donnell. The cliffs of Slave League are no less impressive when they're soaring above you as opposed to plunging below you. Michael's book is entitled In Through People, and I'm about to find out what that means, but not, Adrian assures me, before he catches a decent fish. So, with one eye on Adrian's line, I first of all inquire about Michael's father, the man who once ran the BBC. The BBC was, was started in... Well, he started uh, his uh, operation in 1926, yes. 27, and then he was going till 19... He, got, he died himself from an accident on the BBC bus in 1942, 
and then the bus went on. My mother, the war years were from 39 yes. to 45, so she ran it on to 44. 44. And then she'd give it up, you know. The BB, we should explain the BBC. Is it the Bugger, the Bugger Bus Company. The Bugger Bugger's bus the name of the town land, Bugger. <laughs> Bugger. And yeah. I would, it'd be sad to tell you what Bugger means. It means a soft place. A soft place, yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Bugger Bus Company, yeah. yeah. And that and that was that was actually quite famous in this area. Well, here the the first uh, private bus, as far as I know, in the county, you know. Yeah. And that was see three buses all together. He had a small bus first at Ken Seater. Yeah. Then in the mid thirties he got a sixteen seater, and then he got a twenty seater. Right. And everybody from the area that time there were only one or two cars in the whole area. So everybody he either had a bicycle, uh, you walked, right. or you went on the bugger bus. Right. So he he was one of them. He was the the he, he owned the guy. He was on his owner. Aye. Right. So I I I mean transport and. Mm. Uh, and the funny thing about it, which you wouldn't get nowadays, if you, that time things were very tough in the 30s, you know, sure. they were very poor. And yes. If young lads not on the bus were going on, and if you hadn't the price of a journey to Kelly Beggs, and you said to me, Father, Johnny, I'll see you again. And he would say, Ach, shall I know you? Well. <laughs> of course, I would never see you, you know. Aye, yeah, aye. He didn't, you, you didn't want money, really. Yeah. No. So he, he was give, doing the service for people. Aye, in service, words. aye. Yeah. aye. One of your writings was called uh, the uh, the in through people. Yes. No, go and explain what in through people. Well, would in be. through people is very funny. Got that name from. See, Kelly Beggs, at that time, the all natives Kelly Beggs at the moment. Yes. There's only about a third of the people are so. A lot of Kelly them from Beggs, come, come from outside. outside. Aye, but at that time yeah. they're all Kelly Beggs, you know. But the, the notion because the train was coming in and all that that once you passed Kelly Beggs, yeah. that was we were in Baluba land. That was the end of the world. Baluba. You understand? <laughs> right, so so right. you came if you came from in there, you came from in through. In through. So right. we were called the in through people. You were the in through people. Yeah, so yeah. A, a true native and other. Aye, well it's there from it's only a joke of not sitting and thinking it's the Kelly Beggs. We were just known, that's how they used to speak, the in through people. Yeah. He's from in through the well, What's, what have we got here, Adrian? Tiny little grey gurners. A wee, a wee gurners. They're actually very good eating, you know. That one's, that one's too small, isn't it? So you're an in-through person yourself? In oh, yes, yeah, right. out and out. An, an out and out and three person. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Adrian takes fishing parties out for a living, and earlier this morning he tells me they had to share the waters of this bay with a 20-foot basking shark. His catch on this occasion is thankfully quite manageable. As Adrian himself describes it, a small pollock. Three, three, two, two and a half. Two and a half. It's small. Beautiful fish. Beautiful fish. Mm. Absolutely gorgeous. Yeah. We'll put him back. Live another day? Live another day. Mm. And another day later, I walked the shoreline away to the east of Slave League in towards Muckross Point in the company of Mihal Gillespie. Like me, Mihol certainly appreciates the beauty of these surroundings, but what the stranger sees is not always what the native knows to be the true picture. It's absolutely idyllic here today, I must say. That water's very inviting looking now, isn't it? But you tell me that's the yeah, beach well, that's that has, the, has the dangerous undertow. That's the beach that has the dangerous undertow, and that's yeah. one, of the, one of the dangers about these things, that yeah. you, you could be drawn to it. Yes. And then there is difficulties then. Yeah. So everything everything around here that's beautiful also has a wee dangerous edge to it, you know. That's right. Which is the sting in the tail, isn't that's it? That's right, really? yeah. yeah. That's right, that's mm. like a beautiful woman. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, that's the voice of experience <laughs> talking here. We'll not, we'll not go there, all right. But um, there's a road I can see that takes us right out to the end of the... We haven't got there yet, but keep stopping. They have all these different beautiful yes, views. Yes, we, we'll get there eventually, we'll get there eventually. To, to the head and yeah. see the specific things we want to. Uh, have yeah. a chat about. Yeah. Michael, I think it's going to take us all day before we get to the end of Muckrow's Head because we keep, we keep stopping for all these different uh, different beaches. But this is a lovely spot here. We're down on the actual beach now itself. And there's a very interesting rock formation just sticking out there at the end of it. You're saying that's what probably gives this place its name? That's what gives this beach its name. That is Lore, the Rock of Lore, which um, we like to think is named after an old sea god but it does look like a, an old hag with a shawl. An old hag with a shawl. Yeah. You're telling me there's some significance to this hill up here above us, which is yes. a wee bit steep for us to be climbing, <laughs> let's face it. But we can, we, right. can, we can talk about it, we can see it, anyway, from here. Ah, uh, that is Molly Nebrania, the hill of the fight, and that is where Crapistoon, the king of the fairies in this area, live. Crapistoon? Crapistoon. And uh, there's a well there just below the, the top ridge and uh, we think that that is the only well na left in Ireland that was named after a fairy, named after because a fairy. all the rest of the wells were blessed, 
and so on like that. Mm. But this one uh, still exists, named after a fairy, Crapastoon. And uh, there's a story about the well itself that uh, when he went over to fight the fairies in Connacht, that he said that the locals should look in the well every evening, and if they discovered that it was turned red, then he would be dead. He would be dead. And uh, that is what has happened because he's not he's around not, he's at not the back. moment. So it must have he's turned not. red at some stage. That's right. So when That's you say right. the locals in this instance, are you talking about the local fairies or the local people? Uh, local local fairies. Well, the people had at those times had to live uh, kind of in conjunction yes. with the fairies because if you didn't, some bad spells would be put upon you and right. so, so on. You're, you're advised to keep them up. That's right, them. that's right. Yes, we did eventually get to Muckross Point, the headland of the pig. No pigs nowadays, but plenty of other remnants of past times. Michael's own one-classroom school, built in 1863, now a private home. And, remarkably, the steps leading to what was a market house. Evidence that this was once a busy trading centre with materials going in and out from Sligo, Mullach Moor and Inish Murray. Teelan was once a centre for curing fish, cod, ling and herring, and for making barrels. And here on Muckross Point, Michael tells me, two natural resources were used extensively in previous centuries to make what was an essential commodity. This headland here was all bog originally. You mean it was a lot higher than this would have been? Oh yes, yeah. oh yes. And there was places, places here where my grandmother said it was 12 turf deep. 12 turf deep? That's, That's right. That's a very deep bog. That's a deep bog. Right. And it was all used then to boil the salt water to get salt from it. And a lot of the ground underneath now has been exposed because that's all been cut away. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. Which doesn't help the erosion, is it? The place doesn't help the place? erosion. It's yeah. been eroded uh, gradually, year after year, in reality. Mm -hmm. With every storm that comes, there's more and more. There, on the other side of us here, we had what was called the Muckers Caves. Those caves don't really exist now because what was up above has fallen fell, in. Has fallen oh, in. Yeah. Now we all know about the power of the sea when it comes to moulding and shaping the coastline. You only have to look along these headlands at all the fissures and caves and tunnels that the sea has wrought over thousands and even millions of years. But the truly awesome power of the sea is best demonstrated by what it can accomplish overnight. One morning, back in the middle of the 1980s, after a big storm, people woke to find a few new pebbles on the beach. Except that these few pebbles weighed between them, I'm guessing, several hundred tons. Can you imagine the power of the wave that lifted these big flags from the front of Muckross Point around the corner, carried them inland several hundred yards and planted them down here? Awesome power doesn't do it justice. I think the word I'm searching for is unimaginable. You can see Muckross from the front of David and Nulla Gustafsson's house. You can also see a great deal of Donegal Bay, the Atlantic and Connacht from the front of their house. That's if you can tear your eyes away from the house itself, which was built entirely by David. Not so much a house as an interesting way to frame landscapes, real landscapes, as opposed to the very accomplished ones painted by Nulla. David, as the name and the accent might suggest, hails originally from Scandinavia. But this is one Viking who wields an axe with peaceful intent. Besides these chairs here, or this style of chair, you've also made this one here beside you, this lovely, lovely summer seat. I, um, I make... You make everything of wood, yes? Anything from a toothpick to a two-story house. A two-story house. I'm talking of houses. Aye. Your own house is made of wood. I must say the colour of it is lovely because it's weathered to the same colour as the rocks. Yes. Hasn't it, it suits the, the hill here. It suits the hill. Yeah. yeah. It's very unusual, I must say, to and a wooden house. A lot, anybody can build it yeah. with a hammer and so on. That's all you need. Anybody has a hand. That's all I have. <laughs> Did you build it? Do you build it all yourself? I am. Wife and yeah. daughter help me. Yeah, help me, help me, help me. Excellent. And I put the roof on, the na all the neighbours come up and give me a hand. That's good. Yeah. And how long is it standing now? Twelve years. Twelve years. So it's, and it's standing all the weather that this area throws at you around here, yeah? In all the creek. Aye. If you ever in the boat on a bad day, you hear it creaking. You hear it creaking? Yeah. The same thing. 
Beside the main house is the chalet version, a beautiful wooden holiday house that Nula and David rent out to those with an eye for scenery. Nula is not the only female artist in the family. Their daughter has also left her mark upon the place, and they all do a bit of this and that. The result, I think it's fair to say, is a wonderfully eccentric and playful building. I know what happened here, right? David just had the wall plastic press, and he's had a, a furious row. He's trying to throw things at each other, no? That's <laughs> <laughs> that's funny, what isn't it? Yeah, well, I can't throw anything away. And all these wee bits, these bits, yeah. they all came out of walls. Out of walls? Out of the walls here, the stone walls and down in the soil. Why would that? And they just thrown because, they were, yes. they dumped out? Yeah. That's what you mean. So I couldn't bear to throw it away. I thought, uh, well, it's part of here. Well, it's certainly part of here now. Yeah. <laughs> uh, definitely. <laughs> it's <still happening. laughs> it's clear. It really is funny, the wee handle sticking out. Yeah. You think the rest of the, the dish or the cup yeah. is, is stuck inside somewhere, you know? That's lovely there, isn't it? Who did the painting? You know, David didn't do the painting as well. Oh, I do. You do the painting. Yeah. yeah. Very nice. And look at this floor here. This is very unusual. This kind of almost like stained glass or something, isn't it? The way they, all the wee well, jigsaw really pieces cut together. Mm. Lovely. Right. And David made the beds as well. He did, yeah. And you painted them. Yeah. That's a terribly talented family altogether. <laughs> yeah. And what's this? this, this? Oh, look at that. That was the end of a log. Yeah. And thought, hmm, what will I do with that? Yeah, yeah. It strikes me you, you have fun doing these things, you know, not right. just practical. It happens. Yeah. And that was, our daughter did that at school when she was maybe 15 or 16, the wee thing. The wee stained glass Because thing. there was a hole in the, in the log and I we see. thought, what would we put in there? Yeah. And then we remembered that was lying yeah. around somewhere. It's not hard sometimes to see where the artists and craftspeople derive their inspiration. In Muckross, Kilcar and Glen Column Kill, it's in the air, on the water, on the ground and in the light. Where there is light, there is colour. And where there is sheep, there is wool. Maybe not the right colour. And that's where people like Myra McGinley and Jimmy Carr come in. Keeping alive traditional dyeing, carding and homespun weaving practices that once sustained this whole area. Nowadays, Chappish Gail Chaw, the tapestry artists, turn out these beautiful pictures. But at one stage, practically every homestead had a handloom on which was turned out traditional Donegal tweed. It was an office clerk back in 1826, the story goes by the way, who invented the word tweed through a typing error. Prior to that, it was called twill. Whatever it's called, however sophisticated the wearers who could afford to buy it, its origins were here in the hills and rocks of Donegal. Crottle, what's a very nice colour, crottle? Crottle is the word that you hear the Irish word for, 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 for lichen. Aye, aye, aye. It doesn't look that nice, does it? No, 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 it's, no it's a very good, it's a substantive it, thing. It grows on the rocks. It grows on the rocks. Hills, yeah. Yeah. Aye. Well, I've, I've, we've seen lots of different kinds of crottle. Mm. Uh, is, it, is it just this black stuff you call crottle? Or do you know, do you know the uh, there's a nice light green crottle and there's a, an orange? as well. They are surely, but they would grow in different places, maybe here on top of the hills. Yes. You see, that, that's what they grow on top of the hills here. That's on top and of the hills. And if they uh, it won't grow any place but foul layer. This is a very good sign. Clean, uh, <laughs> no pollution fresh, whatsoever. Yeah, no pollution no, whatsoever. That's a, that's, and that's a good grow, sign of no pollution. Uh, Crottle now or heather, they won't die on anything else and they won't fade. They won't fade. They will not fade. And the colour won't run? No, no. Is that what you mean? That's what I mean. Uh, yes, it won't fade to you. No, it no. won't contaminate all our clothes. No, in other words. No. That's important for washing no. them yes, as well, isn't so. it? Yeah. Right. So, uh, what kind of colour would you get from the crotal? This, this That's a brownish red. Uh, brownish red. Yeah. So if you put it yeah. like yeah. Have you yeah, light this light nice rusty there. colour here. Yeah, Does that come from that there? Crotal, yes. Uh, Seriously? Yeah. You wouldn't be hard to believe that. It's the strongest colour you can get from Irish dye stuff. Really? Well, these are all colours here. These are all natural dyes, and you get them from all these different, mm -hmm. all these different ingredients here, right? Yeah. Now, some of them, that's not terribly exotic. You didn't have to import the no, onions. No, the onion skins. Everybody onion knows skins, what everybody onion skins look like. Yeah. <laughs> well, keep them covered because it's uh, the breeze might take them away. Breeze, from breeze, right. So, <laughs> onion skins are a good dye as well. Oh, a very good dye, surely. Show me the onion skin. You get a bright yellow. yellow. No, the brightest of those yellows on the. See, brightest of the yellows. Oh, yellow. right. That's from onion skin. Yeah. 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 yeah, These are all the exotic things that you bring mm -hmm. in from 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 far and far and wide. Oh, of course, the reds and pinks. The red, this pink. Pink red, eh? Yeah, and that's actually uh, the dried bodies of insects. Yeah. Are you serious? <laughs> yeah. 
the dried bodies of the female insect that lives on certain cactus plants. And you dye your right. clothes with that, with dead bodies. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's yeah. um, that's what they are, seriously. Yeah, that's what they are, seriously. There's, there's no sign of, um, you know, wee arms and legs or anything like yeah, that. Yeah, well, there, if you no. ended up close and, uh, you know, you, you, you notice. Yeah. yeah, well, of course, they're dried. They now, just look like wee stones, don't they? Yeah. Wee, yeah. Wee, wee yeah. Well, how yeah. they gather the females, I don't know. Now they must have good just sight. <laughs> 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 Other dyes were got from materials like indigo, brazil wood, walnut husks, logwood, calendula flowers and sanders wood. Exotic sounding stuff, but the truly native crottle is the one that Jimmy grew up using for dye, with the method that he's demonstrating to me now. And this, this wool's already quite damp. Aye, it has to if you're doing this indoors, would there that's be a... That's what smell, yes. Wood. Yeah, that's why we have a fire. Not very pleasant? No. Not very really pleasant, no. That's why it'll die down. Yeah. 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 On the fire with it? There you go. 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 Is that turf burning there? Yeah. Turf, turf, turf. Some of them might be a couple of wheels of coal in. Okay, lovely. Nobody peaty smell off of them. They're good, they're good, you see. Yeah. Then he's eat with turn. I know this. Do you ever hear that saying, a watch crottle never boils? <laughs> <laughs> I made my farewells by calling on and passing Bernie Cunningham. Bernie's a kind of female version of Noah. You can sort of tell that she likes animals and birds. You can also tell that the peacock likes them as well. In fact, he's a bit confused, this peacock, because when this peahen rejects his advances, he simply switches his attention to the other peahens. to me, Bernie, that in fact you too many different animals together. And they actually seem to get on reasonably well together. Yeah, because they're all in one place. So just... Yeah, but they're not as much. I mean, you'd, you'd think the lamb would be. No, he's been there since he was born. And he's right. just... Maybe he, he thinks they're his family, I would he, say. He thinks he's a hen. Well, <laughs> that could be it. Look at this for display. Please notice me. That's what he's doing, yeah. yes. He hasn't bothered trying to eat anything yet. No, he just does his dance first. 